Welcome to the last talk of today. That's me. And this is a follow-up talk to a talk that I gave at last camp, of course, where I talked about how to reverse engineer this sexy device. And uh, back then I didn't uh, know yet how to break the supposed backdoor in this. But uh, less than two months later, I actually uh, built a catastrophic break of the backdoor and I'm going to tell you how I did it. So this was previously on uh, last year's Cam++. Here are some links that if you want to have a refresher and because some of the parts in these slides that I'm going, uh, prepared for today are also covered in last year's talk during the um, reverse engineering talk, uh, I think I'm going to skip them um, today or just briefly show them. So uh, also this talk can be read up in the journal uh, of proof of concept or get the fuck out 21. There it is Psalm 12. And if you are interested in any of the files related to this attack, then you can have a look at them on my GitHub account. Also after the publishing or publication of uh, proof of concept or get the fuck out 21, I had some uh, actually, after the um, submission of my write-up, uh, but before the publication, I had some new insights, but they were not included in the uh, journal, so I wrote a blog post about those. Um, but I cover those also in my talk today. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to build a full key recovery attack based on only parts of the ciphertext. Which means if you have a piece of the ciphertext that comes out of this uh, machine, then we can, with algebra, calculate the encryption key that created this encryption. And with this encryption key, we can then decrypt the whole message and get access to the full plain text. So there's other attacks. That might be possible, but I think uh, the most catastrophic attack in this case is the algebra attack because on very little ciphertext can recover this uh, can recover the the encryption key, and with we build a whole lot of equations and then we feed those equations to Z3, which is a, a solver, an equation solver. Z3 will solve them for us and then it spits out everything we want to know. It's actually, in retrospect, super simple and might be actually applicable also to other um, attacks or uh, to other um, targets. So what we're using uh, for building all these equations is uh, ClariPy, which is from the Anger project, and it makes it much easier to work with bits or bit arrays in Z3. Uh, I tried to first build the whole attack in Z3, but... Uh, I, it took me too much time and I failed and uh, it was horrible and with with Clarify it's actually um, pretty straightforward everything. So, but uh, let's talk first about what is the main target. The main target of the attack is the key itself. Um, the key on the device is entered as a string of 16 ASCII characters. And then the top four bits, the top nibble is being discarded and each of those 16 lower four bits is concatenated into a key. This makes the key in total 64 bit rig, which is much stronger than this. Um, in theory, of course. So I already showed the schema last year in my presentation, but just to give you a short recap, I'm gonna also show how these work, but only very quickly. So um, uh, each block in this schema has its uh, purpose and um, the most important uh, block, I think, is this top left block, the LFSRs. These are linear feedback shift registers. This is a 16 byte uh, block in which with some operations, a new key is, or uh, yeah, a new part of the key is, is generated. Then we have um, the V block. This is VA. 
and the other half of v is down here. This is uh, this is just a, a static uh, array of eight bytes. These are initialized also with the key. I'm going to show you later. And uh, this block uh, on the top right, uh, the C block, is the ciphertext FIFO. Uh, basically, it's a ciphertext feedback uh, mechanism where whatever you encrypt, the ciphertext byte gets put into this FIFO. This is the, the output of the uh, encryption. And this byte is then put on top of the FIFO. And then with every new byte that it gets encrypted, the FIFO shifts to the left. And uh, this contributes uh, fresh um, bits into this operation here. This is basically a XOR operation which produces four bits, uh, four bytes actually. And then these four bytes are pushed through this P block. The P block is basically uh, a mapping of uh, four bits to other four bits. And this is applied to each byte. Uh, these are four bits really. So this is actually four, um, this is actually eight times four bits to four bit mappings. And uh, then this whole thing, whatever comes out of this block is XORed with the static content of the uh, VB block, which is just uh, some bits of the, of the original input key. And then all this gets fed into this uh, function F, which is a non-linear mapping function. This is also like an S box, but it maps, as you can see from the inputs and the output, it basically maps six bytes as an input to just one byte as an output. So um, basically that's the schema and the interesting parts of this schema are definitely, and these are gonna be our challenges, is the LFSRs uh, to somehow put them into algebra. These are static bit or bytes. This is very easy to make into algebra. This is also pretty easy because we know the ciphertext and also the initialization. So rotating and uh, shifting this is, is very easy to convert into algebra. And this is also just static, so this doesn't really matter. Again, these are store operations that we can see, so this is also easy algebra. Here we see a rotate operation, also easy as algebra. What is the challenge between the LFSRs? Uh, besides the LFSR is then this mapping, which is based on the lookup table and this F operation, which is also based on, yeah, depending on how you count it on one lookup table or eight very compact lookup tables. And these, these really are the challenge uh, in converting this whole system into a set of algebraic equations. So before we get into um, details, or most of these blocks, all of the blocks, so these blocks here and the VB block here, they all get initialized with this function, which basically takes the lower of four bits or it takes four bits from the key uh, or, or something else, and then uh, negates those four bits and puts them in the high nibble. So this is the operation really what's happening in this invert low nibble to high. Um, so basically you get a kind of a mirror image of the lower nibble in the upper nibble. And uh, how is this used uh, for initializing the V block and the C block? Uh, I already covered this back in my previous talk if you want to review this. Um, basically what it comes out to is that C, uh, which is the ciphertext FIFO, can only be initialized each of those bytes to these uh, 16 values. This is not very, um, yeah, this is very strange actually. Um, and then um, V and C, V A and C A gets combined through the, P, uh, actually I shouldn't show this because this is, but okay, so basically what is happening, what we are talking about here is this part here, um, where we have for each byte that is in V, 
A and the ciphertext trifle, we XOR them together, and we map the lower four bits in this uh, in this lookup table using the lookup table, and then we add the upper four bits using the same lookup table, and then we just put the output into an output vary, uh, array, and we also XOR in the fourth byte because if you look at here um, this so far uh, is also um, added to the okay anyway um, so this was um, this also was mentioned already in my previous talk uh, so for the first plain text byte, and actually for all values of v, go to three alpha text values, zero to uh, three. Uh, we can deduce that uh, this value can again only be one of these sixteen values, while the possibility would be to have actually uh, an entropy of eight bits instead of just four. So this is very strange. Again, um, so, and this continues, but I'm gonna skip. Uh, let's have a look at how the LFSRs are initialized. I've also covered this in my previous talk, but basically what is happening that we initialize each byte of the LFSR with using this invert low to high nibble based on the key M. And uh, the state of the LFSR at any point, you can actually reverse the state to previous uh, states in time, and then you just check if the last byte is FF, and if so, you can also check if each other byte has this uh, peculiar structure where the high, high uh, nibble is the inverse of the low nibble, and if that is, you can trivially read out 60 bits of the 64 key bits and the last four bits you can easily uh, brute force um, try out. That's only eight attempts, I think. Um, the update, LFSR, this is the code. Basically, uh, when you encrypt one character, the LFSR is iterated 32 times. Um, and basically, this is what is happening. And this is uh, this is this was quite a mystery. This was one of the hardest things to figure out uh, how to put into algebra. I'm going to come back to this in a bit. Uh, and when the LFSR is done, the uh, 32 steps, and some bits are extracted, and the extraction of the bits is basically this function. And before the bits or after the bits are extracted, they are also rotated by two bits, which really doesn't make a big difference. Okay, let's look at the interesting function. This is the big, um, um, it's this uh, nonlinear mapping, which is basically just a lookup table. Um, the code for the lookup uh, for this mapping is uh, looks like this. We do this eight times because each byte has eight. So for every bit, we do it separately. And this inner loop, we just interleave these four values that come that are used as inputs for this um, for this mapping. So we can go back here, and we see here there's these are the inputs. We have three values that come from here. And these are the PBOF values or contrib yeah, values that are, and these are interleaved. So you, you take um, this bit and then this bit, and then this bit, and then you concatenate this bit and this, and then you get a, a six bit value, which you can. Basically, this is what is happening in this TMP value. And then you can use this TMP value as an index into this lookup table. And this lookup table has a, has a byte. 
and then you just with this operation you just take the that byte and that is being used as the next bit in the result of this quotation. Um, so and then um, there's some little bit more stuff happening uh, of this f function, but it's really this is this is pure. This is if you look at this, this is already kind of algebra. Thing uh, really look uping or anything else. So this is this is, this is really pure algebra already. Uh, thing that is happening after the encryption. Oh yeah, basically this is the cipher text uh, result where you take the plain text and XOR it with whatever is in the accumulator, right? So and then this cipher text uh, character is also added to the to the FIFO, and the FIFO is updated. The cipher text FIFO is updated like this. Again, something that I already showed you in my last, if you want to review that. Okay, so far so good. Most of these simple things are already algebra, except for the LFSRs, the non-linear mapping F, and the PS box, which I haven't really talked about so much yet. But it's kind of boring. Okay, so let's start with the mappings. How do you handle the non-linear mapping F and uh, the S box? That can be handled by a tool called the Möbius transform or it's also called the INF transform and INF stands for algebraic normal formula or you can call it the Jagarkin transform or the positive polarity Reed Muller transform depending on what kind of field or engineering you are coming from they also give the same thing a different name and basically what it does, it converts uh, this lookup table into another lookup table. That sounds very useless, right? But actually it has some really nice property, the second lookup table that you can generate with the Möbius transform. The Möbius transform here in Python uh, is pretty simple and it actually works in place, which is very convenient. So you give it as a um, parameter, the first parameter is the lookup table itself. And the second parameter is how many bits are used as an input uh, for this lookup table, and then the output is just one bit. So this works only on lookup tables that produce that map n bits into one bit. And f is the table that f, right? Okay. So um, this this is a pretty simple uh, algorithm, but how it works and why it works. I have a link uh, which I should add to this slide uh, from this guy, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Valentin Bakuev, and who wrote a very good paper on, on the Möbius transform, which explains all its ins and outs and how to optimize this. Uh, but it's a very popular topic, so the, you find a lot of papers about this, depending on how you look for this uh, algorithm. Okay, so this is the F lookup table. It is 64 values. Of course, that is obvious because you index with six bits, and two to the sixth is actually 64. So um, you index with these six bits, and then you get one of these bytes, and then you take from these bytes you take one bit uh, as an output for for your um, sixth input. And which bit you take depends on which bit you are working on uh, from the input and the output, which is always the same, right? So um, you can separate this. Uh, this is a very compact table because it's really um, lookup tables in one. For each bit, you have Instead of a separate lookup table, you have them in compressed in, in this byte. Um, so if I complain, uh, if I apply this INF transform or the Möbius transform uh, on uh, for, all, um, uh, for the if I take bit um, one from this and bit one from this and bit one from this and bit from bit from this. 
so on, then I get this bit string. And so this is what I call F0. And this is really the first bit each uh, byte in this lookup table. And then I apply on this uh, string, I apply the Möbius transform, and I get the second value, which is then this G value, which it's in various other places by the Möbius transform. And then I take a second bit in the lookup table from each byte and create this F1 value. And I do this for each of the bits. And in the end, I have these uh, eight pairs of F and G values, where the G is always the result of the Möbius transform of the F uh, table for the given bit. Now, you might wonder, why the hell does this work and is this good for? Well, the new lookup to G can be can, uh, converted into a multivariate polynomial. Okay, that sounds confusing. And the formula here also looks confusing. How do I interpret this? Well, basically, F here is really just the, just the bits that you get input parameter. So bit one, uh, bit, bit zero, this is six bits in our case, right? And here, this is exactly the same thing. Here you have six bits that go from all zeros to all ones and all the values in between. So this is if you, in, instead of using bits here, it's basically, it's just a counter from zero to 63, but represented in this value as bit in their bit representation. So that's a0 to a n minus 1. And then you just look up whatever the value is that you have here in the g lookup table. And if it's 0, then you don't have to do anything because this is here multiplication. And if you multiply something with 0, then this doesn't matter at all. But if the lookup table says, the g lookup table says this is value is 1, then in that case, you multiply uh, xe uh, to the ae. And again, if ae is 0, then you don't really multiply anything. Nothing is happening. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of terms that are falling out because of a, the bits of a are 0, or because the bits of x are uh, zero. In the end, this is this is really uh, not so complicated. If you want to compare this, if you want to do this operation in Python, I did this, and it is not really um, algebraic, but it really works on strings. It's cheating, but in the end, it works very well. The output of this for F4 looks like this. Well, okay, I have to explain something here. Uh, when we say, this is the XOR operation, right? And on Boolean algebra, the uh, product or the multiplication operation is really an AND operation because if you multiply zero with anything, you will always have zero. And the only case when you get one is when you multiply one with one. So that is really the end operation. So this whole thing is just a set of XORs and ANDs, nothing else. And so for F4, the result of this transformation is this, um, this equation. So whatever the force for F4 are, you just calculate uh, one XOR uh, bit, zero, XOR bit one, XOR bit two, XOR bit zero, and bit two, XOR, and so on, and so on. And this is the equation. This is based on just four, uh, on just six bits. And whatever the result is of this equation is exactly the same as when you would look up the value of the six bit in the F4 table. And so this is algebra, fuck yeah. This is something that we can feed instead of a lookup table. This we can feed actually into that tree. 
This is, and we can also, of course, generate these equations for F0 to F7, not only for F4, of course. But this is pretty simple, right? This is not really complex or um, doesn't even look like much. Okay, the P-transform. The P-transform is also an S-box, but instead of 6 to 1 bit, it maps 4 bits to 4 bits. And uh, this is not really... Möbius can only work on transforms that bit map to 1 bit. But you can actually just decompose the 4 to 4 mapping into 4 mappings that each do 4 to 1 bit mapping. So you have first a mapping that bit maps the 4 bits to the first bit, then the four bits to the second bit, and the third and the fourth bit. And so you have you, you need to do four Möbius transforms, and then if you have those four Möbius transforms, you have the mappings, and you can just convert all the four to four S-boxes into, into more equations. And that is again, ta-da, algebra. So that leaves us with only one uh, thing that we need to put into algebraic um, notation or into a set of equations, and that is the LFSRs. So um, with the LFSRs, I didn't really get. Uh, last year, I didn't really understand how the LFSRs worked. I, I was told that these were LFSRs, but I had no idea how they work. Uh, and I was just uh, blindly believing that these are LFSRs, but I had no understanding of how this works. But if you look at, uh, at the update function of how the LFSRs are uh, updated, then this is, this is the heart of the whole update. And uh, the magic actually happens in the lookup table. But I only realized this after publishing or after submitting my write-up to the fine journal. And uh, the lookup table contains the taps for linear feedback shift registers. The taps are the bit positions that you XOR upon each step, right? And so in this case, they were bit sliced. And so that means that um, they were instead of, yeah, bit slice is a uh, basically you have. Uh, Yeah, how do I explain this? Um, maybe you can come back to this later. But basically, these are the the tabs, but in a bit slice representation. And to recover them into a normal uh, human understanding, this simple Python script, which really just reads the bits from left to right and then from bottom to up, and recovers you tabs. And so this is a much nicer representation. And here you can see actually the tabs already as we recovered them. So these are the positions of the tabs. The first one, this is a 27 bit linear feedback shift register where these bits here are not part of the shift register at all. Uh, this is a, the 29 bit shift register where you see the tabs here in the, in the bottom. And these bits are not part of the shift register. There's only one bit in the 31 that are not part. Here you see the tabs again, and so on and so on. And so this is the output after reading out the um, positions of when extracting the bits from the LFSRs after stepping them 32 times. And the um, color codes should actually tell you where those bits come from. So this yellow always comes from these bits, and then the little bit darker yellow comes from these bits, and then this goes into X1. And so the, here you can see what bit slicing really means, that the, um, um, strangely, actually, this should be represented in a way that this is uh, bytes are uh, vertical like this, but always two bits next to each other together form one byte. So these, so first you take these uh, top two bits, then you append the next two bits, and then, and this is how it stores in in RAM. So this this forms one byte in RAM. But if you look at this in um, a logical representation, then actually um, every uh, 
keys repeat. Um, these have a different structure than in uh, logically than than how they are represented and operated on in RAP. Okay. Um, so, but we can also the 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 tabs also be represented as a as a bit um, representation or an hexadecimal, which is also quite common. And as you can see, there's a few tabs here, um, but all of these are of maximum length. So each of those um, SRs has a maximum. Um, in total, I think um, I think the LFSRs have have a total length of fifty six bits or something like that. Okay, um, a little bit before I actually understand how the LFSRs work. I did another uh, approach, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And uh, with that approach, I also uh, grouped the bits together. Now let's come back to this in a bit. This is an interesting picture and also shows um, interesting details about uh, how the uh, bit slicing works actually. So how do we algebra? How, how do we make algebra out of these LFSRs? They are kind of LFSR. Uh, they are kind of uh, algebra already, but it's uh, difficult to um, do iterations to that into into algebra. How do you do that? So what I did, I totally ignored that these were LFSRs because at the time when I was attacking this, I had no clue how these work. What I did, however, I I used anger and symbolic execution and uh, what I did is um, I fed I fed this function into anger symbolic execution without telling it what the LFSR array is being initialized to so this this array is completely symbolic uh, which means that uh, each of those values we have no clue about and anger doesn't care it just says okay this is symbolic and then we run we executed this block in anger in symbolic execution and at the end we just ask anger what it knows about this lfsr array after running through this uh, symbolic execution and um, something funny happened i got this output actually it's much longer because this is only for the 127th bit and there's 126 or 27 more bits um, being calculated but i omit this for the sake of brevity here in this presentation so this one bit anger and clarify knows that the uh, output the 127th output bit of the lfsr state is calculated by doing this on the previous state on the bits of the previous state the notation is a bit confusing here because it always uses uh, this notation but it's always one bit that is being used it's always this just one bit so you can clean this up and basically when we clean the above up then we can say the lfsr state 127th bit in step e plus 1 is basically if we XOR the 7th bit, the 14th bit, the 23rd bit, the 30th bit, the 31 bit, the 46th bit, the 54th, and so on from the previous state together. And whatever the output of that XOR operation is, is going to be the value of the 127th bit. And we can do that for all of the bits. Um, and so what was interesting, what I was doing here, for me, I was, this, this was super cool because this allowed me to do very simple algebra. Basically, I have 128 simple XOR equations that tell me what the state of the LFSR is after 32 iterations of stepping the LFSR. And without actually having any clue how the LFSRs work or, or anything else. Uh, but I was very interested in one thing that I was interested if, if I can see any correlation between the bits, the output bits, and what input bits uh, contribute to the output bits. If there's any kind of clustering or something. Or 
because we had this uh, picture came out, I learned that this um, this top section here, these bits, they all depend only on input bits in this red area, the highlighted area. So there's nothing of all these bits are only calculated by storing bits from this area. And then I also learned, of course, then you can, it makes sense, then, um, then the second section, the green section, only depends on bits area and then the blue and the and the xian uh, area and if you look at uh, there's a little anomaly here this one this bit actually depends on the bits from up here which is a bit strange and then the green area here is depending in the in the blue area depending on the green area and the blue area in the science section is depending on the bits from the blue area but if you count these bits, this is exactly uh, the bits that are missing from the LFSR. So this is the 27-bit LFSR, this is the 29-bit LFSSR, and this is the 31-bit LFSR. So here you can see again uh, how these bits are packed together in this bit size structure and how compactly and, and deliciously, I have to say, this is this implementation of these four LFSRs in such small space and in such efficient way to advance the LF, all four LFSRs at the same time, it is, I think it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's amazing. You should spend time in looking at the code and trying to understand it because uh, it's mind-bogglingly beautiful, I think. Um, and I actually, I highlighted the, the two bytes that are being used uh, for extraction of the bits. At the end so these are the bytes that contribute that are the output of the lfsrs and what is interesting here is that actually um, it's these strange uh, bits that belong to the previous lfsr uh, but it is really just a result of rotating uh, or not rotating but really uh, shifting the lfsr on and since it begins the LFSR begins here and continues here and then whatever you shift out from here this part it just appears here and whatever you shift out here appears uh, I think here and then when you shift that it goes to sh it's being shifted here and then here and then it falls out and the same is true so these these LFSRs, they actually bleed into the, the next LFSR. Uh, and so these short LF, um, shorter LFSRs, they, they contain bits from previous runs of the LFSR. Uh, and this depends on how, how long the LFSR is really. Anyway, this is a, this is a beautiful, implementation and i think this is not from the nsa itself but this beauty comes from the implementers at philips who had to implement this backward and uh, they were resource constrained because the cpu that they were using uh, has very limited ram and has very limited uh, computing capacity and so this was the most uh, computing intense operation in the encryption and they had to optimize it and i think this is a brilliant way to do it super efficiently so but yeah tada algebra also the lfsrs have been converted without actually having a clue how the lfsrs work and uh, it's amazing how how useful symbolic execution is in this case to to convert some code that you have no understanding of into a set of quite simple um equations so when when we come uh when we put all this together all these uh, equations, then we can hand it over to Z3. Uh, and uh, putting together the equations themselves takes quite some time. It takes about 40 to 50 seconds. But this set of equations can then be reused. So you just have to build a set of equations once. So this, is, this time amortizes the more keys you actually want to break. Uh, the set of equations in total, they um, take about 22 megabytes. Uh, 
And uh, when you pass this set of equations, 17 bytes of ciphertext, then ask Z3 to solve it for the 64 bits of the key. Then Z3 on this laptop of mine, which is a ninth generation Intel uh, Core 7, takes only four seconds. And the nice thing about this whole algebraic attack is that if you have less than 17 bytes, it still works, it just gives you more key candidates. And so if you have only 16 bytes, then you have two key candidates. If you have 15 bytes, you have four key candidates. If you have 14 bytes, then you have eight key candidates. And it goes on and on until you have only one byte, in which case you have 65,536 key candidates. You can all try, but in the end, they will all give you one character, an ASCII character. And how do you know which of those ASCII characters is correct? So that is kind of, a, it doesn't make any sense anymore. But also for less than um, 17 uh, six bytes, in many cases, it actually might lead to a, a solution to find the key and the plain text because you just test all the key candidates and what gives you plausible plain text is the solution and also the key. Um, so other attacks. I, I don't know if NSA had an SMT solver like Z3 back in the 80s. I think this whole attack, because SMT, the, the whole attack that I'm building here is very generic and Z3 is also generic. I think the whole attack can be simplified and implemented without an SMT solver or by doing a, a specialized implementation of this SMT solver. Only this problem. And then it might actually be a simple uh, or similar attack than what the NSA was doing uh, with their own SMT solver, which they had in-house, I guess. Uh, they certainly had correlation attacks, but correlation attacks are not um, uh, not as efficient as my as this algebraic attack. Uh, I think I found on the internet because I was looking of, of what kind of uh, tools the NSA might have had in, in terms of attacking linear feedback shift registers. And I found uh, the PhD dissertation of uh, a person called Armknecht, uh, which I can warmly recommend if you ever want to break any linear feedback shift register. This is a comprehensive work from the early 2000s. And I think that it can be assumed that uh, what has been a PhD dissertation in the early 2000s has been state of the art in the 80s at the NSA. Um, there's another problem with this whole um, uh, encryption um, or the whole tool is that uh, it is super easy to detect key reuse because basically this is a stream cipher. And the stream cipher only depends on the uh, encryption key, of course. And because the the whole encryption is ASCII only and the last and the first byte are known, uh, every message leaks 16 plus a bunch of bits, uh, key stream bits in every message. And uh, that means uh, basically message length minus one bits plus 16 bits. And th uh, those bits give you a very high chance of a low false positive rate of of detecting key reuse. And if you have uh, solved the key for one message, then you don't need to solve the key again because you just see, oh, this is the same key. And then you just use that key for also decrypting later messages. So this actually, I think there's more backdoors than just one in this uh, in this implementation. And they help the NSA to amortize the cost to, uh, of, of a full algebraic attack uh, because I believe it might be still quite expensive and hardware on the 80s uh, of doing this attack. But since it is this second bug makes it possible to only break each key once and not having to do that every time for every message. I also uh, consulted a uh, um, one of the authors of AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, if he can recommend me someone who who might help me figure out how the NSA might have done this. And he re, uh, re recommended me to Willie Meyer, who's, I think, already in pension. 
uh, he's the other expert on linear feedback shift registers and but he said that uh, these functions look all involved and it's quite striking that you found an attack but for he didn't see the back door in what I uh, showed him in my uh, paper in the journal and uh, everything so it was quite a, a surprise for him that this is uh, so catastrophically broken um, but it's still interesting. I think I'm still going to contact also uh, Armknecht and uh, Willy Meyer again if we can figure out more about uh, what the approach of the NSA might have been. If it have been, if it might have been uh, something else than an algebraic like this. So in conclusion, this is a full key recovery in less than four seconds with 17 bytes of ciphertext, and thus this means that the Vector is catastrophically weaker than uh, the data encryption standard, which I cannot do a full key recovery in on my laptop at all uh, in such a short time. And uh, there's also another conclusion that this is really multiple backdoors uh, working together. And I think there might be even more than what I just uncovered. Also those that I have been mentioning about the uh, weak entropy that is being used to initialize all the blocks. Um, so there's a bunch of people that I want to thank. Ben was the guy who wrote the first uh, reverse engineering of this firmware freak who helped me with a emulator for the whole thing. So if you want to run this firmware, you can actually run it in an emulator now and uh, you can play with this yourself. Uh, the Crypto Museum people, of course, Jonathan, Anton, Valentin, Dangelers, Eskimo, and Dnet for their support. So that concludes my talk, and I am looking forward to your snoring, your silence, and your staring, or if you have questions. Hmm. Everyone snoring? I think, I think that was the, the longest lightning I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a lightning talk. Oh, it wasn't it was a lightning talk. Okay, sorry. It was not a No, it was a scheduled talk. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, I can only say I like to see it happen. Uh, a few months ago, when it was going to ISC, and you had these new backdoors every few days, which was nice. Which what? Sorry, I didn't get it. It was scrolling through an ISC, and you had these new backdoors every few days, and that was really nice to watch. Yeah. <laughs> It was fun. Actually, I'm working on a new one. <laughs> ah, or oh, I will be really starting. And the nice thing about this one is that I can use Ghidra for that. So breaking NSR backdoors with an NSA tool, I love the irony. Finally. Maybe another challenge is to find the original NSA backdoor. Well, you mean the code that is doing the break or what? Maybe maybe they had some kind of mathematical tool they used to attack these feedback shift registers or, some, or something, or they used to design them. And definitely. Also, if they have any papers about this inside, yeah. Use of anger made me think if you plug this uh, functionality in a, in a modern compiler, maybe it just optimizes all the crypto out. <laughs> But, now, yeah, the thing is that um, if you look at this equation, if you if you do it bitwise, you take each bit and then XOR it with a bit from another byte and then another bit from another byte and so on. This is really not so efficient, even on modern hardware. I think the most efficient implementation of doing this far as I can see. Actually, what these guys did in this uh, bit slice interpretation, which is just fucking brilliant. Let me show it to you again, because it's so beautiful. This. This is all it is. And it's really quick. So basically what the takeaway is, here there's two things that I used. Is the, the Möbius transform to convert the lookup tables and the S boxes into algebra. This can be applied in other cases when you have S-boxes as well. And to simplify the linear feedback shift registers 
using symbolic execution into a set of equations from the input uh, state into the output state. And uh, that is that is all the tools that were really necessary to break this. No further questions? Then thank you, Steph, for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night.